Hello, everyone. Today we have Brad Eckerberg again, and now we're talking about the benchmark analysis that he has conducted along with the MetaFarms team, but also with um, it being a project that has been um, brought to you as well by uh, the National Pork Board. How are you today, Brad? Doing very well, sir. How about you? Doing good, doing good. So fuel was in. What did you learn on the finishing side and wind finish side of things? Yeah, I mean, from uh, from the finishing side, I guess uh, some of the observations was, uh, you know, the impact that summer heat really does have on uh, on the outweight, you know. So when does it happen? How long does it happen for, you know, and what is that impact? And, you know, you look and you might see there's maybe, a, you know, a three to five pound difference. But, uh, you know, you got a thousand pigs that you're marketing in a barn. Uh, that's a lot of pork that's not being produced. Um, so I think that was a big observation there on the finishing side. Okay, so you say uh, summer versus winter was it about three pounds? Um, yeah, it's about. Uh, let's take a peek here really quick. It was, uh, you know, about a seven pound difference. You know. Okay. So saying about that six to eight pound difference, depending on the month, you know, from the high and the low from uh, throughout the year. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's that's quite a bit. How about you know if we, we zoom out a little bit and look at the evolution over the last few years, uh, where we are for mortality, uh, the weight, um, you know, average gain and those main parameters. Yeah, so I mean we're we're producing a heavier pig uh, uh, from 2019 when compared to 2017. You know, the, uh, the, the high end in 2017 was 282 pounds on a finishing group, you know, for an average out weight, where now in 2019, you're at 284, 285. And again, you know, it's maybe two or three pounds. But again, you're marking a thousand pigs. Uh, that's a lot more pork that's being produced. Very good. And then I'm looking here at the report. So mortality, we are about a 4%, um, right? The, the ballpark on the finishing side, at least. Yep, yep, yep. Four to five pounds usually, yep. And then six percent on the six percent mortality on the wind finish. Um, what else did you find on the on these reports? I mean, any if you want to dive a little on the finishing, and then we can move more to wind finish. Uh, any any other things that that caught your attention on the finishing side? Yeah, I mean, on the finishing side. So you know, we talked previously about how the uh, the impact uh, for nursery mortality and. And how you know that purr starts to flare up in that October November time frame, and those groups aren't starting to close out until you know earlier in the year. Um, you know when you look at the the finishing mortality, it, it's very similar to like nursery actually, where you start to see the the first uh, really two quarters of the calendar year, you're starting to see a higher mortality than you are towards the end, and I think that's just a, a vicious cycle of you know the the, the purrs hits you know, late in that October, November time frame. Then we've got about four or five months of tough mortality, kind of uh, gets better than towards that second half of, of the calendar year. And and uh, and then again, like a vicious cycle, just kind of rinse and repeat, so. Right. Um, and if you move to the wind finish side, uh, any, any, any difference there or, or very much the same? So the wind to finish, um, the, from a mortality standpoint, we're seeing uh, really the mortality at its at its highest uh, in that summer time frame. And uh, yeah, a big thing to remember is, um, you know, the, from a mortality standpoint, for we to finish, those groups are about six months, right? So where those pigs are being placed early on in the calendar year, they're not closing out until, you know, that summer slash early, early fall time frame. So really when you're looking at for mortality, the big thing to remember is when are those pigs uh, being placed and then thus how long on feed are they usually uh, taking from that perspective. Another comment I wanna make really quick on the wean to finish, it's, it's important uh, to note that we're only benchmarking on single stock wean to finish barns. So if you've got a barn that uh, you're saying uh, is a double stock or you're filling at 150%, uh, from a metaphors benchmarking per perspective, we're gonna throw out those, those groups that are double stocked or uh, you know really above 150%. So uh, something to remember when you're kind of comparing your numbers against our numbers. How many um, 
just for folks get a feel for the size of the database and everything, how many farms or, or pigs are involved on this data set? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, from, a, from a nursery standpoint, uh, from our previous conversation, uh, in 2019, we had about 9,300 groups that were closed out. Uh, finishing, we're in that uh, 11,500 groups that are closed out in that database. And then from a wean to finish, uh, single stock in that 3,400 uh, groups. And really the, the, the size of the groups obviously vary. Um, but uh, one also thing to kind of note is, you know, those, those are a lot of groups, but Metafarms also throws out roughly about a third of our groups stay, uh, due to a, a, a data validation checks that we do to ensure that we're, we're um, uh, benchmarking on, on numbers that are, are within our normal standards and stuff. Right, right. Um, and then if you look inside any of these metrics, I mean, there's always that big difference, right? Between the, the best performing, not only groups, but also uh, flows and, and producers or production systems. And so any insights there uh, from our experience, uh, again, on... Um, we talked a few episodes ago on the nursery side of things, but how about here? Any any differences here to that you see among the best and the worst? Yeah, I mean, so what, one of the things that we do for our customer base is we do some benchmarking on on the size of the groups. You know, so if I if I've got a thousand head barn, how is that performing compared to like a five thousand head barn? And just you know, for for another angle maybe to look at for 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 users within benchmarking and stuff and. Um, you know, looking at some of the, the numbers uh, for our finishing would be about 65% of our groups are in that 3,000 head or less. Um, and when you look at it from a mortality standpoint, um, within those groups that are 3,000 or less, it, it really, um, from a mortality standpoint, makes up a lot of those groups um, that are actually, uh, uh, that are, are dying. Uh, surprisingly, the, the larger groups are doing surprisingly better. Um, you know, again, it's a smaller sample size, uh, but the, the larger groups seem to be doing better. And I'm not sure if that's from an animal husbandry standpoint, that maybe there's some more laborers out there. Uh, maybe there's a newer uh, uh, facilities. Um, again, it depends on the producer, I'm sure. Right. Have you ever done um, any analysis on like the number of sources and that kind of approach? So um, it's a little bit challenging within our, our system and stuff. Um, it's easier on the nursery side than it is um, from, uh, from a finishing side. Um, really from the fact of, you know, tying in that sow uh, into our nursery is a lot easier for our customers to do. Um, whereas in the finishing side, really kind of bringing all that information together is something that we're working on currently today is I want to be able to look at a whole production from sow all the way to, to uh, finishing um, and tying all that information together. Um, but we doing some initial studies that we've done and stuff. It, it really is flow dependent. Um, you know, surprisingly, we were working with a couple of our customers to look at mortality uh, based on the number of sources that you have, you know, say a single source versus, you know, seven or eight different flows that we would do, you know, and from my background, you know, obviously single source is kind of ideal, right? But looking at it big picture, is it financially um, as well as performance wise, is it what's best for the company? Uh, but again, going back to some of the analysis we've already done is surprisingly the two to four sources actually perform somewhat better than a single source. Again, you might want to bring in also like what the health status is, you know, are we pulling out one of the farms because of a, a health issue uh, that can obviously impact uh, performance as well. Interesting. Wow. I mean, yeah, normally the, uh, and it's a tough, uh, controlled experiment uh would be tough to run a controlled experiment in that kind of situation but um that is interesting and also three uh two to four but then like you said uh hopefully the same health status right it's you know and then you know it's it, are the two to four flows are they are they it's a micro flow is it a purse you know or is it a you know why are we grouping those together so it's important to look uh you know being a data person digging deeper into the numbers to see 
what are, what are those single source or why are those sources brought together? And that's, that's something where, you know, the end user, the, the company themselves knows why we group those together. You know, from my days at home farms, you know, there's reasons why we grouped multiple farms together. And it might be a health status that standpoint, or it might be just, we want to get these barns filled. And we would see that, you know, as we're preparing for those, you know, summertime temperatures, you know, we might need to combine more flows together to try to keep that weight up and in that finishing. And by doing that, we got to keep the pigs in there, but we still got that, that ever, uh, never ending flow of pigs coming out the saw farm that we got to find a spot for them. Right. And uh, on the feed, feed efficient side of things, I'm looking at the numbers here, 2017, 18, 19 for the finishing, I'm just going to read them to folks. So 2017 was 2.81, 2018 was 2.8, so very much similar. And 2019, 2.82, so all of them very similar uh, within the 0.02 range. And I'm assuming that's not adjusted, is it? No, no. no. Okay. You know, and, and something that um, I would encourage as I was looking at like the fee conversion is, um, man, there's really not that much of a difference from a year to year on an average standpoint, but really looking at it from a percentile. Um, again, it's something that we do for our customer base, but looking at what is the percentile with the top 10% versus the bottom 10%, and you'll see a very large uh, swing in fee conversion, um, you know, and the dollar figure per tenth of fee conversion really varies on from company to company, but it's very impactful, especially for larger producers that every tenth of fee conversion is really impactful on the bottom line. Right. And you always have to be careful, right? Is that coming from a, a well, saving feed, right? Uh, a, right. Uh, correct adjustment on the, on the pan coverage, uh, or is it, uh, cor you know, management side of things when it comes to um, temperature in the barn versus, Hey, I'm just adding some extra fat and I might even be losing money. I'm just, just chasing that feed conversion number, right? Which is not something I see very often in the U.S. as much as I see sometimes in other countries. Yeah, I mean, and don't forget about late-term mortality as well, right? You're putting all that feed in the pig and whether it's at transportation or even the last four or five weeks of uh, you know, pigs being in the barn. Uh, surprisingly, there's that's a higher number, I think, with uh, with customers than what they actually, uh, you know, even even look at is on, on the grill finish side is why are those pigs dying late in production? Because again, we got all that cost into them that just inflates that feed conversion. Yes, that, that's huge. Um, as we wrap up here, Brad, any final comments on, on the benchmarking that you've done for finishing and, and wind finish? Uh, not to sound like a broken record, but keep it simple, right? From the producers out there in the barn, feed, water, air, you know, a healthy pig, you know, is going to lead to a, a more profitable uh, pig when it's all said and done. Um, so health, health is king um, and, and really just kind of keep it simple for producers. And, and when you're looking at from a benchmarking perspective, you know, again, averages are nice, but really looking at from a percentile standpoint, um, and, and see what that variation is, not just from a, from a MetaFarm standpoint, but also from your own internal company. I love it. To be a joy, uh, Brad, uh, thanks so much Thank for bringing that information for us. My pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity. Imagine if with a few key concepts, you could have the potential to create a massive positive impact by bringing from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for swine producers. Join us on this small group and go to the next level of swine nutrition on this seven week long elite online training in applied swine nutrition and feeding by myself and my world class invited speakers. Additionally, you enjoy an exclusive community to exchange ideas. Go now to www.eliteswinenutritionist.com.